Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Michael Hibben, and I'm here with Anythink Libraries, and I'm so excited for you to join us today. We're speaking with Colorado artist Helen Hebert, uh, speaking about her work here uh, in general and this week at uh, Anythink Wright Farms. Uh, she's created this magnificent giant paper lantern you see behind us, and we're going to be talking about that and, and her work in general. Helen, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Michael. It's right. been a great week. It has been a great week. We've had a lot of fun working on this lantern um, and meeting Helen and working with her, her and her team. So let's start with a little bit, little bit of, uh, about your background. What inspired you to become an artist? Well, I'm going to thank my mother for nurturing that. She, um, she took art classes when I was in middle school and when I was younger, she taught me how to sew and just really encouraged all kinds of arts and crafts. She actually had artist friends who she hired to teach me and my friends how to draw and paint. She wanted to support these women artists mm -hmm. while um, giving us kids an, an experience. So that, yeah, that's really what got me started. And I studied art in college mm -hmm. and just always I never I don't think I necessarily wanted to be an artist I wanted to be an architect for a long time hmm. um, but I worked for one and I realized how long it would take not realizing how long it would take to do any profession right. but I, I sort of gave that up uh, naively okay. I might have liked that but <laughs> yeah instead I became an artist excellent yeah. so uh, our viewers may or may not know that your primary medium that you like to work with is paper. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know what inspired your passion for the medium of paper. Yeah, so um, yeah, I went to college. I went to the University of the South in Tennessee and it was a very small liberal arts school. I don't have a BFA, I have a BA. Um, I probably could have done anything I wanted there but I didn't know enough. So I just took drawing, painting, photography, there was a small art department, but I was able to spend my junior year abroad in Germany, and there I went to an art school, and um, it was just fortuitous. I didn't like plan on going to an art school, but I did the University of Mainz. They had a great art department, and I took a class there called Paper, and we it really opened my mind to the potential of paper as a medium. We built furniture from cardboard. We made paper using a blender. And we, uh, I dabbled in pop-ups and paper engineering. And so I just, yeah, I just became faceted, fascinated with all the different things that you could do with a sheet of paper. Excellent. Yeah. Have you always worked in paper or, or have you worked with any other mediums in, in, in your creativity and your art? Yeah, primarily paper. I mean. Um, there are other materials in this lantern, for example, reed and a balsa wood, and I'm interested in sculptural forms, mm -hmm. um, and paper sometimes alone isn't enough, so I add other materials. Did a lot of drawing as a kid and in college, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's been paper since my 20s, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Now, you have also published several books. Uh, the latest, which uh, came out in February, is The Art of Papercraft. Mm -hmm. We've got a copy right here. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the book and the role of books in your work? Yeah, so um, I feel like The Art of Papercraft really brought a lot of my career together. Way in the beginning, I, I had worked for a printing company, and we, when you print large projects like annual reports and postcards and greeting cards, you have to lay out the projects on large sheets of paper and they get cut down and I became really interested in like how one sheet of paper can be transformed in so many ways so this book has 40 projects it's a how-to book that you can make from a single sheet of paper and I designed 15 of the projects and I have 25 guest artists um, from around the world who are amazing artists and use the medium in different ways than I do and that's just something I've always kept a pulse on like what's going on in the world of paper mm -hmm. so I'm really excited to be able to bring them all together in this book. That's excellent. How long did it take to pull this book together roughly? A long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say three years uh, working. I had about a year to put together uh, the outline and the manuscript and then I sent it off to 
an editor. I worked with a publishing company, Story Publishing. Mm -hmm. So the editor there uh, spent a couple months digesting and sort of reorganizing, uh, helping figure out how to make it the best it could be. And and then photography, design, all those parts take uh, and printing, of course. This was printed in America, by the way. It was printed during the pandemic, and they do print a lot of their books overseas, but um, there were all of those shipping issues, and mm -hmm. they were able to pivot and print it in, in America, which is cool. Nice. That's yeah. wonderful. All right, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about your creative process. Okay. Where do you pull inspiration from? From my life, really. Um, I, I really think about things for a long time. Like this lantern, for example, I've been thinking about it for many years, and my ideas just percolate. Um, yeah, I, I did a big piece about motherhood. I have children. Um, I'm really interested in, I almost majored in math and art, so, and I mentioned the architecture, so I'm interested in geometry and sort of, uh, just matter of fact, you know, like shapes and lines. And so I actually make artist books that as you page through them, uh, they're very simple but elegant and they tell stories in different ways than what we're used to mm -hmm. looking at. I have a piece with string and you open the pages and the strings move and turn into lines. Yeah, so a, a lot of places. You've been yeah. in, in the art world for a while. Mm -hmm. Which other artists inspire you? I have two favorites. Um, I discovered the work of Solowit really early in my career, and he, he is a thinker. He thinks about like um, lines going this way, and then this way, and then this way, and his work is just uh, fascinating to me, mm -hmm. the thought process. And then I really love the work of Eva Hesse, who is more, uh, was interested in materials. And I always wonder, she actually lived near the paper studio I worked at in New York, but it wasn't there when she was alive. And I, I think she would have been interested in paper as a material. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, her fascination with material really inspires me. When you're working on your projects, tell us a little bit of, give us some insight into what it's like. Do you like to listen to music? Do you listen to podcasts? Do you prefer silence? Tell us sort of the average working day for you. What, what, what is the, what are you listening to? What are you doing aside from the project itself? Yeah. Yeah, I have a pretty versatile work day. So when I'm in my studio, um, if I'm having to think about something, you know, really planning. I, I don't like to listen to anything. Um, and then when I'm doing something mundane, like making, I actually make paper. So making sheets of paper, it's pretty repetitive. I, I like to listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, Do you have any favorites? Yeah, I listen to The Moth, Storytelling, mm -hmm. Fresh Air, to keep a little bit current. Yeah, I don't listen to a lot of music, occasionally. It's kind of the last thing I think of. Right. Oh, there should be some music on, yeah. <laughs> now, working with paper is challenging because a lot of paper, for all of us who are not artists and who don't work with paper, seems very fragile. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the most fragile paper you've worked with and what's the strongest? Can you tell us about those? Yeah. Well, the most fragile is tissue paper, mm -hmm. you know, just like that you put, wrap your gifts in or toss in as an element for packing. Um, but I've actually built a hot air balloon using a similar structure to this lantern with tissue paper. And the key there was that the tissue paper is light so it will float. You mm -hmm. can't have a lot of weight. Right. So you just have to be careful and pay attention. And if you get a hole, you patch it. <laughs> and then the strongest paper, uh, well, that's a good question. I make paper using a banana fiber it's from the trunk of a banana plant and really? it's called abaca this this fiber goes into uh, tea bags and other commercial applications but i use it uh, i have a machine to process it and it is very strong but it is also delicate at the same time so 
that's one of the qualities I really love about that paper. Right. So it's a lot more, uh, the medium is more than people maybe think when they just think yes. of the paper. There's, there's a lot Definitely. of range there yes. to strength and delicacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for young artists? Someone who's watching this, this live stream right now and, and thinks, wow, you know, I would love to be a working artist one day. I don't, I don't know how you do this, how you get into this. How do you become an artist? How, what advice do you have for those young people who are interested in, in becoming an artist or uh, cre creative in a profession? Yeah, well, I think we always need artists. I think artists are amazing um, at thinking outside of the box and coming up with ideas. And um, I just think that young kids who are interested should pursue their passion and um, ask questions. Look at other artists. That's what I did. I looked when I was wanting to do it as a career. I looked at what they, how they, how they did it. What did they do for work? How mm -hmm. did they make their living? Um, because there's so many things you can do with uh, art. You can obviously I make my work, but I only spend probably 15 hours a week making and 25 hours doing the bookkeeping and the marketing and there's a lot more to being an artist than just making um, and if you don't like doing those other parts you find someone who can help you with those parts mm -hmm. um, but yeah ask questions keep learning and um, yeah I think we have a need for many many artists for sure, for sure. Yeah. I do want to remind uh, the audience watching online, if you have a question you'd like to ask Helen, just put it in the chat and we'll get to it as soon as we can. Um, Helen, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the week at hand and what you've <laughs> been doing here at Anything, this amazing lantern. What was the inspiration for this lantern installation? Yeah, well, I've been making small lanterns for many years, over 20 years, um, and I learned this technique and form. This is a traditional Japanese uh, collapsible lantern called a chochin. And I just thought it would be cool to make a really big one and started thinking about um, what light is and being the light and, and had the vision of being inside of the light. Um, this will actually be hung tomorrow and it will hopefully it's going to hang about shoulder level so you'll be able to step up and be the light and um, at, you know after I got this artist in residence gig I started thinking more and more about that the sort of the conceptual part and how um, yeah I want viewers to step inside step into the light and become the light and then step back out of the light and shine their light in the community or think about how they can shine their light in the community because so, it takes all of us for sure yeah uh, the lantern is impressive uh for those of you watching online it is over six feet tall or is it about six feet tall yeah. tell us about the construction of this lantern i mean from the process of you first envisioning this how did this come together Right. Well, as I said, I've made smaller. So this is a model. Mm -hmm. And in the back, there's a foam core armature. And it's this amazing Japanese structure. I mean, they've made these for hundreds of years. And um, I actually had an artist friend who learned how to make this. I didn't go to Japan to learn it. Um, but she, she knew I would be interested, and she showed me how to do this. So um, a small scale, I just make the armature in foam core. Mm -hmm. And it's just got these two rings, the top and the bottom. So that's what we're mimicking in the large scale. And um, these ribs that could be cut into any shape, any profile shape. And they're all the same, so they just go around. And then, and then you wind reed, rings of reed. So this is just an eighth inch reed around and make these rings. And so... I think you can see they're here every two inches. On that form, they're every inch. And that creates the structure for the paper panels to go on. So these paper panels are like, you know, like a section of fruit. And in the big one, there are 16 panels. So every other panel goes on, and then every other panel uh, overlaps. 
and um, when we get done here, we're going to do the magical part of, so this is foam core, but in, inside of there is a wooden armature, and we're going to tip this on its side, pull the bottom out, and the, all the pieces will come out and we'll be left with, with the lantern. Um, those little frilly things at the top, and there's some at the bottom too, will actually, those are just left to go over a ring which has the electrical parts, so this, that's how it will be wired and suspended from the ceiling, and then the bottom will be tucked underneath. Excellent. And you, you used a special kind of paper for this particular lantern. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, this is called Kozoshi, and it's a paper from a paper supplier, Hiromi Paper, um, in Los Angeles. They sell lots of different Japanese papers. Mm -hmm. Japanese papers really uh, are thin but strong, and they let the light through nicely. Mm -hmm. So this is the same paper here. And um, yeah, I bought it on a roll mm -hmm. and uh, cut it into the f shapes that I needed. Right. Yeah. Do you feel like, you know, you planned this out for a long time and envisioned this, and as the construction happened, were there any surprises? Did it, did it go pretty much like you had pondered or thought, or was there anything that didn't go quite like you thought and you had to make modifications? No, it, pretty, it went pretty well, mm -hmm. but I will say that I, I think about things a lot, so I went over it many, many times mm -hmm. in my head, anticipating every thing that could go wrong, and thankfully, so far, so good. Right. Yeah. Now you talked a little bit about this uh, in an earlier question, but you know you have worked, you have created lanterns before, not one this big, right? right. This is the largest right. lantern you've ever created. What do lanterns signify to you? I just, uh, I think light is peaceful and calming, and um, you know it's the first thing we witness when we're born. I actually remember when my son was born. Um, our bed was in a uh, near a window, and the moon would shine in. He was actually bo born on an eclipse, hmm. um, but you know, in his first few weeks, he would get distracted. He would be looking at that moonlight, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, lanterns just are yeah, they're beauty, they're calming. Yeah, I love I love light, and that's really what I love about paper is light filtering through paper all the way back to that uh, I went to Japan early on and saw paper coming through um, the paper sh uh, light coming through the paper shoji screens mm -hmm. and it's just magical that's it really is magical it's isn't it? almost um, yeah something to experience it's hard to describe mm -hmm. yeah excellent how do you hope people will feel interacting with, with this piece once it's installed? Yeah, I hope they'll have a sense of awe mm -hmm. and a sense of wonder. Um, it, as simple as, oh, how was that made? Or mm -hmm. why is it here? We're gonna have some prompts for them. Um, yeah, and calm, mm -hmm. yeah. Helen, where can people go to learn more about your work? I have a website. That's the best place. It's HelenHebertStudio.com, and Hebert is H-I-E-B-E-R-T. I'm on Instagram at Helen Hebert and Facebook. I have a Facebook group called The Paper Studio. If people are interested in paper, we share what we do with paper there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you give, I, I believe you give classes too for people interested in creating with paper or learning more about paper art. Can mm -hmm. you tell us more about those classes? Yeah, I have an annual retreat um, in my studio in August every year. And um, I do occasional master classes for people interested in learning to make paper by hand. Mm -hmm. All this is on my website. And then I teach online as well. Um, I do occasional six week online classes. And then I also have a membership group called The Paper Year where we, um, we explore a different paper technique every month. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and where can people get your book, The Art of Paper Craft? Where is it available? It's available wherever you purchase books. Yeah, online, in bookstores. You can ask your bookstore to order it if they don't have it at the library. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah. 
do we have a couple of questions from the audience? Let's see. So here's one question that people would like to know. How are you inspired by Colorado's landscapes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I do a little bit of paper weaving and I, I have woven some landscapes that remind me of the mountains. Um, and then it's not something that I, you know, I respond to all the time, but the light, yeah, the alpenglow. Mm -hmm. So I'm always thinking about light. Excellent. Thank you. Here's another question for you. So how does collaboration impact a piece? Yeah, I'm not sure what that person is asking, but I collaborate in a lot of ways, and I really feel like um, collaboration makes a piece richer. So I've, I've collaborated with poets on some of my artist books um, where maybe I've had an image idea and then I've told the poet and they've written a poet, a poem that responds to my work or vice versa. Um, uh, in making this piece here, um, I was happy that I decided I needed two volunteers at a time. That was the perfect number, mm -hmm. not too much, not too little. So um, you have to let go when you collaborate on a big project like this. I would never have survived making this on my own. It was <laughs> seven solid days of work and tedious, just like gluing over and over. So having the help um, was wonderful, but you know, you have to, certain things happen, a wrinkle here or something shifts there. Um, so I'm okay with that for the, the greater good of the piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, here's another question. What are some ways we can make art more accessible to all? Mm. Well, I think this library is a great example um, because I've been working here over the week and people are in the library and can stop by and get curious and see what I'm doing. Um, I really also, I want to engage people with the piece once it's hung. So it's, a, it's meant to be a community installation where people um, can make their own smaller lantern and think about themselves as the light. I just think uh, introducing children early in life, um, not, you know, people tell me a lot that, oh, I'm not an artist, I'm not talented, and I just think that's not true at all. I think I had to practice and learn, and I've spent years becoming this artist, so the same thing happens for a scientist or a mathematician or mm -hmm. construction worker, you know. For sure. So just to to encourage people to be creative and that it can be a profession too. Here's another question. Uh, tell us about what else is coming up this summer. So in relation to the lantern, I'll tell you. Um, mm -hmm. So these are the little lanterns that people will be able to make themselves just drop in um, and, and make near the installation. And then I'm coming back in July, I think starting July 19th for a week, and we'll be making a super mini version of this um, at each branch of the library, the seven branches and the, of Anythink libraries, and then at the Bookmobile as well. So um, that's a sign-up program. You can find out about that online. And then we're going to have a culminating event on July 30th here at the library with lots of activities outside, fun for kids and adults, and a lantern procession at the end. It's going to be July 30th from 8 to 10 p.m., so the lights will be, it'll be dark outside and it'll be really magical. Wonderful. Well, Helen, it has been a pleasure talking with you, and we've been uh, so excited to see the work happening at, at Anything Right Farms this week. Thank you for being with us. Um, our lantern installation uh, will be ready on Friday for those who want to come in and see it. So we're really excited to have everyone come in and check out this amazing piece of art. And lots going on with our My Summer program this year with Helen and other great programs, and we hope everyone can join us. And again, pick up The Art of Papercraft uh, at your local bookstore on Amazon or online. Helen, thanks again. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.